Hello, this is Joseph Carlson, and this is episode 128 of Gaming with Grief, and this is called New Medicine Part 2. But I want to remind you guys that this podcast will hit my website, www.gamingwithgrief.com, Monday morning at 7 a.m., so go there, leave a comment, let me know what you think of the show or how you heard about the show, or you could subscribe to the podcast on Apple iTunes or the Google Play Store. So go there, leave, give me the likes, the subscribes, all that kind of stuff. Or you can write to me at gwgpodfellows at gmail.com. So go there. Uh, again, write me an email and let me know how you heard the show. Um, I'm getting a few more listeners here or there. I hope they're all real. Um, and you can find me on Twitter at Just Little Joe. So yeah, this is just a follow-up to last week's episode, New Medicine. Uh, I actually got to interview my therapist, uh, and you'll hear him shortly. It was a really good talk, um, and he is semi-retired, so we kind of pick up from there. Uh, so enjoy, everybody. Yeah, just, I mean, just tell tell people about yourself, because I don't think, you know, I've talked that, talked about that you're my therapist, but I don't think I've ever heard your full credentials or... I haven't got a timeline of how long you've been doing it or anything like that. So. Oh, okay. Well, hello, everybody. My name is uh, Bill Melanie. I'm a counselor and a coach. Uh, I'm uh, 71 years old, and I've been uh, doing this for more than 40 years, and I am uh, gradually moving my way into retirement, uh, where I'm uh, doing that primarily by uh, not accepting new clients and waiting for people like uh, uh, possibly like Joe, to uh, decide, I don't really need you anymore. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm concentrating on doing some writing, maybe doing some preparing for teaching. Uh, and uh, I come from a background of uh, uh, what's called the psychodynamic uh, uh, thinking, which is sort of based on Freudian theory originally. Um, and then uh, pretty quickly when I got into graduate school, I, uh, I got... Uh, uh, involved in first in family therapy and then in uh, in some other types of uh, therapies that are called constructive therapies uh, and post constructive therapies, which are really about not assuming that everything that you have that uh, that affects you uh, emotionally is because of your mother. Uh, and uh, thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> right. right and. Uh, um, and so um, I've been, uh, you know, I've taken, uh, gradually I got more into family therapy and I got more into hypnosis um, and uh, I did uh, worked as a child therapist for, a, for quite a while. I was in a, uh, in a uh, program, a street called, so-called street program. Um, <clears throat> shortly after I got out of school, uh, when I finished my master's degree, I was a carpenter for about a year and a half because I was sick of my head uh -huh. um, and uh, uh, just wanted to work with my body. <clears throat> and then, uh, uh, and then I had a, uh, a, a what do you call it? A, uh, an epiphany that I, wait a minute, you have a master's degree and you're working for five and a half dollars an hour pounding nails. Right. <clears throat> Maybe it's time to get back into it. Right. <clears throat> so then I got, eventually I got working with kids uh, that were in, at first, they were in uh, residential treatment programs, which is what I'd done when I was in graduate school, <clears throat> to work in children who were in group homes. And then I went, uh, from there, I went uh, uh, into uh, um, a street program, which was working with kids in their homes who had been referred by Child Protective Services and Juvenile Court. Um, and, uh, um, and I did that for a while in Tucson, Arizona. <clears throat> was that so? That was was it? Kids that were like, uh, I don't know, not just trouble, but were they like uh, in the foster system and stuff like that? Or some of them were in the foster system. Um, probably about half the kids that were in the program were in the foster system, and the other half were in their their own largely dysfunctional families. Um, and so it involved. Uh, I would see. I had a caseload um, of. I think it was somewhere around 10 uh, kids at a time, and uh, <clears throat> the expectation was to see the kid in some, uh, some context every day, uh, oh. Monday through Friday. Um, so sometimes that meant uh, just going out and meeting them uh, in the street, uh, going and 
playing. Uh, sometimes they come in the office. Sometimes I go into their homes and uh, <clears throat> work with their families. Um, uh, the idea was to keep them uh, out of the child protective system, out of foster care, or if they were permanently in foster care, try to help them uh, to transition into something that would be better um, and not to get arrested again. So how does, uh, aside from the, I know we're going to get into it, but like, how do you, is that like a designation from the court where you would permanently be in foster care? Is it just something where you just don't, they, they don't find, they're not finding a home for the children? So it's, they just... it's more like the latter. Uh, occasionally, uh, uh, somebody uh, in social services, at least in Arizona at the time, now remember this was back in the uh, early 80s. Mm. Um, so occasionally somebody in the, uh, in the, in the system would uh, describe a kid as being unadoptable or unmanageable, uh, and so that they were going to always have to be in foster care and probably always in <clears throat> changing homes because they burn out the families. Oh, right. uh, uh, that was not common um, and generally not official. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> but I remember working with a a case, I forget what the nature of the case was, but I, and in juvenile court, uh, um, often the, the system defines a kid as incorrigible. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, I remember having a discussion with an attorney, um, I think he was a defense attorney, I think. Um, he might have been a prosecuting attorney, <clears throat> who actually said these words to me. We're all child molesters. It's just that most of us haven't committed our crime yet. Wow. <clears throat> wow. Yeah. That's uh, that's really troubling. <laughs> is to say that like <clears throat> and I had a good deal of uh, of information about how he was as an attorney. Oh yeah. Uh, and uh, so eventually uh, as part of that program I started uh, I was getting training in uh, hypnosis and in mm. uh, and in with some some of the non-hypnotic uh, applications of hypnotic theory, um, and I uh, began teaching that both hypnosis and that kind of uh, non-hypnotic therapy. And I had uh, uh, the agency that I worked with allowed us to have a private practice in hmm. addition to the job. So I had a small private practice, and uh, <clears throat> in 1987, I uh, uh, I decided to quit the agency and just go directly into private practice. And I've been doing that ever since. Nice. So I guess, I mean, I sent those articles over that had to do with games and grief, but just as an overview, you know, you and I talk about it a lot. And I know sometimes we just chat. You've called me out on that sometimes. Like, what do you need? You know, it's good to chat sometimes, but what do you need? But also, like, when you hear me talk about games or, like, D&D &D or video games, is there like kind of a psychological, are you like, okay, so this is good that you're applying this? I mean, it's constructive, right? You're not just like, well, you know, you're doing this for fun, but like, what is it doing for you? Is it something where you can hear me and say, well, this does help you in a way, or is, is there like some kind of constructive? Yeah, that's a good question, Joe. Um, uh, I, th I know that you're a very uh, intelligent and undereducated guy. Um, uh, you've got your bachelor's degree, uh, you're capable of, uh, of having bigger degrees if you wanted to. Um, and, uh, uh, and that you're a very intelligent guy so that I know that you are thinking about, uh, I'm particularly interested in, in psychological thinkers. Um, and I know that you are a psychological thinker. Um, you came from uh, difficult situations with your parents and, uh, and, uh, and, I don't know if you've shared very much. Maybe you have in your podcast. I think. But... I, well, I mean, I, I I kind of have. There's. I think this is episode. This is episode one twenty eight. So I have talked about my parents a little bit. I redid the eulogies for my dad and my mom. Um, like and and it was. I I you know. I think my mom had a good point. She was always angry at my father, and she said something years ago where she said, you know, you always thought your dad shit ice cream, and uh, I know he does not. And I know my mom doesn't shit ice cream either. You know, it, it's it it, yeah. it it wasn't even after they died. It was even before that when you become an adult and you're able to look at the world and say, well, you guys aren't perfect. I love you, but obviously you're not perfect, you know, just like I'm not perfect, you know. So, right. yeah, it's, it's, I don't know. And 
so like I said, like, do you think there's kind of like, a cons- like, okay, so it's constructive that like, you always tell me to write and do that. Is it same way with games where you're like, well, this is obviously helping you be, you know, whatever yeah, healing in a way. I don't, uh, I don't really, I'm not a game. Um, I used to play a lot of games when they were only board games. Uh, and I like playing board, board games. Um, <clears throat> but I've never done <clears throat> very much video gaming. When uh, when Nintendo first came out, um, I was 40. Uh, oh, yeah. When my, when my wife made the mistake of giving me uh, a Nintendo player, and I got oh, yeah, sort the, of obsessed with Zelda. Oh, yeah, the gray box, the gray box. <laughs> uh, yeah, the gray yeah, box. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, the NES, yeah. And, uh, so I got sort of obsessed with Zelda, and, and I didn't sleep enough. And, uh, <laughs> and <clears throat> my... Um, my thought processes became focused on uh, this the problem solving the problem with Zelda. <clears throat> so that's really my only experience with video games uh, because I realized that for me anyway at that point it it was clearly addictive and it wasn't really adding anything to my life. <clears throat> Well, I mean, that's with that's with everything, though, too. I mean, you can be head down in so many books that you're not paying attention to the world oh, and watch too many absolutely. movies. Right. I think there's this conception where if people see you play a video game and you do it for more than an hour, they think that you're even nowadays with it being more mainstream, they think that you're somehow defective, you know, like, yeah, like, I've never I don't have the opinion about you or uh, anybody else as a gamer as being defective, <clears throat> but I am curious uh, and you and I have talked a little bit about it, about how is it that gaming um, contributes positive energies to your life? Um, I, I think for me, it's just generally the online space of trying to uh, be positive. There is a lot of negativity out there, especially with games and the news and how they portray gamers. But there's a community of people that I watch or follow that are positive, that talk about how it brings people together how you can have great online experiences with people, uh, stuff like that. Like there was a game I played recently called Journey that was a very short game. It was 90 minutes. It basically was uh, an allegory for the Buddhist sense of reincarnation. So you start out in the desert as a humanoid creature that is covered in, uh, this has a robe and white eyes. And as you move, like in the distance, you see a mountain. And as you move uh, through the game, uh, it gets harder and harder to get to the mountain. The snow, actually, once you hit the base of the mountain, snow starts. When you get to the tip of the mountain, um, you basically are reborn. And uh, what happens is you find other people on your journey, and you think, oh, that's kind of a cool thing that that... AI controlled character looks like me, but in the end credits, it was actually someone just like you, uh, and you can't communicate uh, except through like a chirp button. You make a chirp, and so it's actually really powerful to realize that that was another player going. You were what? That it was. It, it wasn't just you on this journey. There's someone else that looks just like oh, you, okay. and you think it's uh, the computer. You think it's an NPC, but it turns out to be an actual live person doing the same thing that you're doing. And right. that's kind of neat to you, you're like, wow, we had this experience together where we experienced this. And I didn't know till the end because it just says at the end credits, this was so and so or whatever. You know, this was the, this was a real person. So right. to me, that's I mean, that's one example. But that's the idea that games can be more than just shooting people or, you know, whatever, uh, being violent yes. or whatever. So, you know, well, and I know that uh, uh, <clears throat> I never had any uh, interest in the shooter games. I, you know, really, I only played a little bit of uh, Mario Brothers, the original, um, and Zelda. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and neither of them had much going on about shooting. No. Um, <clears throat> and uh, Zelda was a problem-solving kind of game. And, yeah, a lot of secrets, uh, too, where you'd feel like a genius if you're like, I burned that bush and there's a stairwell there. That's crazy, you know, stuff like right. that, like Easter eggs yeah. that they put in. And My son, uh, he's 29, he went through a period of time where he was into a certain kind of games when he was in late middle school and uh, early high school. Um, and uh, uh, so and I, I was interested in, you know, one of his games was a Harry Potter game and mm. was, would be similar, I think, to Zelda. Uh, he also played games that were building games like, uh, like uh, uh, what's that one about farms? Um, oh, like, like Farmville probably or something Farmville, like that? Farmville, one of those things. And he also had one about roller coasters 
coaster construction and oh yeah um, roller coaster tycoon that's a big one yeah some of the some of those it's like management skills because you have to manage the park and keep patrons happy you have to have the right type of rides and stuff like that so right but and he was also he was also into civilization oh yeah Uh, so i i sort of watched him and i could see oh yeah that was sort of like the games that i played except i played them on a table with a person yeah i think for me that's it like the for me like you know, your original thing about, you know, what is this adding to your life? I think some of it is it's just a different way to look at something. And I think at least with the podcast, that's what I try to do because, you know, when you go through your own journey of life, no matter what it is, grief or whatever, games are another medium where they explore, you know, it's a perspective. And you could say this is a good perspective or a bad perspective, just like if you watch a movie or read a book or something like that. And I think for me, that's what it is. It enriches in a way where you're like, yeah, this is a different way to show a uh, perspective of something, you know? The, yeah, and also it's, uh, you know, I think uh, for uh, many people, I think I, I have uh, I've talked to you a little bit about uh, possibly uh, getting some games because I knew that they were fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that for a lot of people, when they play the games, they are fun. I live in, uh, uh, and presently I'm living in Mexico, and the word in, Me- in Spanish for fun is divertido. Um, which has the same root as uh, being uh, diverted. Uh-huh. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so you have, uh, uh, I think that life is hard. Um, and uh, so if you're always being serious and focused on uh, things that make life go, then, then you're not, you know, fun is an important aspect. So and, and often you need to get diverted. Right. Uh, to like recharge real, or... Real, real fun... Uh, the word ecstasy um, has in its Greek root uh, uh, out of, that's ek, um, stasi, that is yourself, essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, uh, ecstasy is experiences that you're not in your own stuff, you're right. somewhere else. Right. And so I think that there's probably an advantage uh, in, in any kind of gaming. Uh, uh, I know a little bit more about Dungeons and Dragons than I do about video gaming because I that's probably that's games. probably my fault that's probably my Dungeons and Dragons and his best friend and he played Dungeons and Dragons so I know a little bit about it um, and uh, so I think that's fun and it gets you out of being yourself yeah I mean it's, I'm it's, I'm experiencing that a lot now because like as my wife says you know you always play really good people whenever you play a game and uh in D and D, I'm playing a game where I get to be a jerk. My character is a big jerk, and I don't think. I mean, the players are smart enough to know when the session ends. Joe's not a jerk, but it is interesting in the game when they're like, "Why, why, why are you being like this? You're such a jerk!" And I'm like, eh, "It's trying something different, you know, like to right. not be myself and not be the goody two shoes that I always play." And and I was gonna ask you too, like the. You know, this, this idea of getting away from yourself, like you kind of need, like you said, you kind of need that because, you know, the, the world is complicated and you can get into doom scrolling and, and see how futile everything is. And I think just mentally you need a break, you know, so. Yeah, um, <clears throat> yeah, I could definitely see that. Um, and uh, I think that's probably, I believe that's probably healthy. Yeah. It's, uh, <clears throat> it's, it's not perhaps not healthy when when a person over identifies with a character especially a character in a video game who's killing as many people as possible yeah what i do the one positive thing i'll say about online in the community is you know there was a there's a game called uncharted where it's basically indiana jones you play a character that is basically indiana jones but he shoots a lot of people and there's been a lot of discourse lately about, you know, he's just really killing a lot of people, even though he's finding these artifacts. And right. that's one thing I like about the online discourse. It's not people being negative at the game. They're just like, this is kind of weird that this character is like this happy-go-lucky guy, but he just murdered 20 people in this room. And, and that's the kind of stuff I like in games where you can examine it. And again, that's why I kind of do the podcast, the idea of... You can see that some of these games, people were affected by grief, but I think some of them, I'm, I'm working on a bigger project uh, later for later next month, but it just seems like it can be like a movie, like a horror movie, when you're like, well, this isn't really saying anything about the human condition. This is just them stabbing people 
and cutting off heads. And I think in games you do that too, where you're like, that was really shocking to kind of just be shocking instead of having a statement about it or something. And, yeah. you know, I, I think for me, especially with the podcast, it's important. It's like, if you're going to talk about death, let's get really serious about it. You know, let's not, you know, we're getting to the point where games have been around since the late sixties. So I think we can talk about real things now, you know, or somewhat real subjects. So, right. and, and, you know, again, so you, you feel that there is like a benefit to, okay, take some time off, you know, go ahead and play a game an hour a day or whatever. Like it's not hurting, like it's not physically hurting you or mentally hurting you. Like it is important. And kind of. Yeah. Important. I was, uh, you sent me a couple of articles and uh, the one I read this morning I forget the name of it. It was the second one that you oh, said. Oh, yeah. The, uh, the one about, uh, I think it was dealing about witness. depression and Firewatch, maybe? Was that was that the game? Yeah, Witness and Fire... No, uh, the one about uh, uh, Celeste. Oh, yeah. I didn't know if that one went through. That was, I think it, that was an actual psychologist, like his blog. It was. Talking right. about Celeste, which I played in is very difficult. It's a very difficult game where I was like, it'll tell you how many times you die in it, just like you said in the article, where it's like, you've died a hundred times. And you're like, I don't want to be reminded of that. But then at the end, it'll be like, you know, you can do it. And you're like, can I? I don't know if I can. <laughs> but uh, and one of the things that I was struck by is that uh, she said uh, that, she figured it would take uh, 80 to 100 hours um, to get through the game. Mm -hmm. Now, that seems like, uh, is that a productive use of 80 or 100 hours? Uh, uh, well, I don't uh, know. I, I think what a lot of people said, I haven't played Celeste, but I've heard a lot about it because it won awards, was a lot of people said at the end of it, it made them realize about their own anxiety and their... Yeah, I read you know, about that. So, yeah. in a way... You're like, yeah, is that productive? But it's like, if you play that game over 80 hours, you're like, oh my gosh, I have anxiety. You know, like that could be in a way like, you know, oh, I'm exactly like this character and I have these same feelings. Right. So it's yeah. like, I, you know, I don't, and I think some of it is you don't sit down for 80 hours straight. A lot of it is two hours here, three hours here. Oh, it's a rainy Saturday. I'm going to spend half the day playing or whatever, you know. But I think the 80 hours is at the end, the game clock will say, you've spent 80 hours playing this game, which you're like, whoa, you know, I didn't know that. I right. was playing in a couple hours well, a night. I, you know, I have had clients uh, come in, not you, but other clients who, uh, yeah, the eight hour, 80 hours, was that was, le that was last week. Oh, uh, yeah. <clears throat> and, uh, and who also don't have any, you know, they don't have anything else that they're doing. Right, right. Uh, they're, they're working and they're playing games. And if they have a little bit of time, maybe they catch some sleep while they're uh, um, playing a game. Yeah, I mean, well, like everything else, that could be a problem where it's like, hey, you yeah. need to like go see the sunlight or something. You know, even I, I'm a big proponent of actually going outside and seeing, you know, trees and <laughs> like the morning right. and stuff, you know. So, so the first article that you sent me, uh, uh, I forget what it, what it was also called i could look it up on it's got screen. an incredibly long uh title but it's yeah. basically like that uh that he was a cancer patient um i think oh, Steve, that's right yeah, that, that's steven right. uh gonzalez i believe yeah he I, I drew from that that um uh <clears throat> what i know about uh, uh being you know taking care of yourself and healing yourself uh or contributing to the healing of yourself from either a psychological or from a a medical uh, problem is that you really do get a lot of help from all the parts of your brain. Um, and so any kind of, and the article made a point of saying, it's not just video games, it's, it's anything that really you are devoting your creativity and your expansive thinking to. Mm. Um, and that makes, that makes a tremendous amount of sense to me. Um, so, uh, you know, if you're writing a novel, um, I know you're a writer, that's, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's good for you up to a point where you um, hate everything that you're writing and you want to stop doing it. Yeah. Um, temporarily. Usually, um, usually it's the rewriting process that I start cursing and my wife will be yeah. like, what's wrong? And I'm like, I got to go do rewrites and I don't want to go do rewrites. I don't want to do it. <laughs> I don't right. I, the rewrites yeah. are but the one But that's part of the creative process. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, the mind, brain, uh, the body, body, the mind, uh, body connection is significant mm -hmm. um, and we do know that there are people who get cured of cancer for example um, unexplainably mm -hmm. um, at least medically unexplainably right um, and it is now becoming more clear that 
the, that creative process, um, along with some other things that you do to really like mindfulness practice, um, various kinds of mind, mindfulness, even prayer, um, right. uh, can contribute to physical health. Well, uh, yeah, what I, what I took from that article, which I think was important and what I've seen very little, is the idea that uh, you basically become your illness when you get sick. You're no longer a person. You are a can- you are a cancer patient. You're no longer whatever your identity is. And then on top of it, uh, everybody focuses on that. You know, like even my when my father had cancer, I talked to him about it. Uh, and then that's what you become. And the focus they said in that when you take your focus away from just being a cancer patient is almost kind of helps in the healing process of, you know, and even the pain, it takes away some of the, you know, yeah, the, like because of the self identification, uh, you know, there's a, there's a process, psychological process called nominalization. Um, and uh, nominalization is taking a, a verb, an action and turning it into a noun. Uh. Uh, um, and so what do you hear when people talk about cancer? It's almost always my cancer. Right. Yeah. Um, what happens when people talk about anxiety? It's my anxiety. Right. Uh, uh, my depression. Mm. Uh, uh, and for that matter, it's even my fatigue. Right. Um, and when you start to own all those, uh, those verbs, then you, you own them and you don't have any control. Over them. Do you... Have you used games, even though you don't really game or anything, have you used games as therapy? Have you listened to someone that has anxiety or something and said, you know, maybe you should try board games or maybe like just to get their focus maybe away from their anxiety oh, yeah. or depression or, you know. Um, yeah, I have, um, I have done that. I have, especially once I get to know a person and I know what their interests are, then I try to, um, if they're expressing some kind of a, uh, mental or psychological or emotional problem, then I try to uh, figure out a way to um, help them to channel it or to neutralize it. Um, and so, if uh, uh, if somebody's a, uh, a likes to play games, whether it's board or physical or Dungeons and Dragons or whatever, then I'm likely to say uh, do more of that. Um, if if it's my motto is uh, uh, if it works, do more of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and if it doesn't work, stop doing it. Uh, yeah, that's actually a good motto. <laughs> have you have you seen any, like, I don't know how they're going to take to this, maybe, and then they start doing it, and then they're like, you know, you see an actual mental kind of, or change in them. Like, you, you do you see it improve? I mean, has it worked before? Like, the idea of, you know... I don't, think, I don't think I've ever introduced something to a client that they weren't in some way already doing oh i got you like do more of this like you told me yeah. like write you need to write you used to write right like okay so i need to write more you know yeah so it is true that with kids however <clears throat> gaming in some way <clears throat> is always a useful way of, uh, of forging a relationship uh, not not solo games but uh playing chess for example or playing right. checkers uh um, or I had a had a kid who uh, who started to be willing to teach me playing magic, the nice. card game. Nice. Uh, um, and those were uh, <clears throat> those are relationship building. I actually uh, the official Dungeons Dragons podcast that I listen to because I'm that big of a nerd. They they've had guests on like teachers that have used uh, Dungeons and Dragons in school to help kids that have like social anxiety or depression or, you know, maybe they uh, have like autism and they just can't communicate with people. Oh, yeah. So they literally set them in a group and say, like the teacher will say, nobody's going to die. We have some rules, you know, you can't say anything offensive to whatever. Uh, nobody's going to die, but you're going to work on this problem together. And by them being someone else, like a rogue or a fighter, and then having to work as a team, they said it's been amazing what they've seen with kids. Oh, I can see that. Kind of great. like, you know, and they, they said it was crazy because she had one instance where someone did die because they did something very foolish, and she goes, I couldn't. It's a rule. We try to bend the rules, but obviously we wanted to show them consequences. And what happened was on 
uh, the group in a group chat, which she keeps open with the group. She didn't reach out, but the group reached out to the player and said, are you all right? Your character died. And it was like the kids kind of coming out of their shell asking, yeah, you know, great. are you okay? Your character died. And they were like, I'm okay. I did something really dumb. I own it, you know? And it's interesting to hear people say that, you know? Um, yeah. And so when people say like, oh, D&D, that's a game. You're like, but that does have a practical thing where you have to work. Oh, I think so. I imagine so. I'm, uh... When D and D first came out, I, I took a little bit of interest in it, but I was so busy that I never, uh, I never really got into it. Yeah, it's hard. Some of those sessions are really long. Where even me, when I play a lot, I'm like, "Are we wrapping this up, or what's going on? <laughs> like, this has gone on for a while. We need to wrap this up." So yeah, it's like cricket, right? Uh, it could go on for oh, days. Yeah, no, yeah. That I've seen some cricket matches where I'm like, "Can they speed up a little bit?" <laughs> like, I don't know. I'm like, yeah, I don't know if that's really working. Right. So I mean, you. Uh, what would you, what would you say to people that think that there's, how should I say this? What would you say to people that think there's absolutely no benefit to games in general, or that if they're going through something terrible like grief or trauma, if you tell them like, hey, you should try playing this card game, uh, or you know, hey, you used to do this, do this again. What would you say to somebody that was really skeptical about something like that? You know, that was really like, oh, I'm not doing that. That's I'm not going to play magic. That's stupid, you know, or whatever. Well, probably that would come from an, an adult. Uh, <laughs> probably, probably from an old adult. Right. Uh, and, uh, and the more, as we get older, we get more and more intractable. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so I don't try to push stuff with clients, but I, I, I always try to encourage... Uh, uh, thinking or doing things that are different, right? Uh, and uh, so I, I don't know enough about games really to know what I might suggest, right? right? <clears throat> but I have uh, I do uh, I, I recently uh, reconnected to my high school best friend, nice, uh, who, who I hadn't seen in probably fifty years. Wow, uh, <clears throat> and. Uh, he lives in Portland, and now I see him fairly frequently. And we used to play Avalon Hill board games oh. every day. I think uh, they're still around too. Like I think they're still. I think they are. Yeah, right? I think they're still pumping them out. Yeah, I think for me the problem with board games is it always seems like they try to get very complicated lately. They're like, okay, to learn the rules, it's going to take an hour before you even set up the board, and you're just like, yeah. I just want to play. So there's a lot of stuff online where there is some companies that are putting board games in a digital form online. So right. you, Avalon Hill is one of them. Oh, yeah. I know they. <laughs> there's like um, Catan, which is online, and I played that at my friend's house on a real board. But I could log in online and play online. Um, and it's a great way to learn, too, because they'll just tell you what to do, and you don't have to waste time at someone's house like I did when I was playing Catan where they'd explain the rules to me before we could play. You know, it's something where you come yeah. in and go, I got it a little bit, you know, so. Uh, so I guess uh, in some ways I still think about, think like a 10-year-old. Uh, so <laughs> I, I, I did get a couple of games, I think, that I found on Avalon Hill, or I don't know how I found them. Because uh, the Avalon Hill games my friend and I used to play were always war games. Oh, like so World War II and... Battle of the Bulge. Yeah. Uh, Axis uh, and Allies. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, I got a couple of those, and I, uh, a couple of times I started to play them, uh, but I don't know how to make anybody do anything. Um, and uh, so it's a matter of the mechanics of it. Mm. Uh, and there's even one game that you uh, recommended to me uh, that I have never been able to get past the first one and a half minutes uh, because uh, because there's some method by which on your screen you're supposed to be able to throw a bomb. Um, oh. and I've never I've tried it at least ten times. I could not make the bomb flow. What game is that? Do you remember? Do you remember what game that was? I could probably look it up. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, you could look it up and send it to me, and maybe if it's online, like, you and I could play a match and we could figure it out, because there is ways to talk online to each other where we don't have to be toxic. I've gotten in lobbies where you're like, that person is incredibly racist. I don't want to talk to them. But you can do, like, peer-to-peer -peer stuff where we're just talking or whatever. Yeah, so. that's probably true, I, I suppose. Um, I had never thought about that, about uh, maybe there's a, 
uh, like, uh, you know, I collect, I, uh, one of the ways that I uh, charge for my services is using credit cards. Right. Um, and I, ha- I have a, I use a square as a credit card process. Oh. Uh, well, I just found out yesterday that because I'm in Mexico, um, I have a so-called invalid location. Oh. Uh, so even though the card is good, um, I'm not good. Oh. Um, <clears throat> and so... Uh, I, I, I tried to find out, and the Square has virtually no uh, support services. Mm. Everything is only by frequently asked questions. Well, I, I would recommend if you have <laughs> but a. They d- have a community. Oh. Uh, so there's a community, and then uh, so I connected to them, uh, and maybe that's what you're talking about. Like with with a game, there's a community of players who are oh. not actually playing at the moment. Right. Uh, but you but can our schedule. Resources- yeah, resources for idiots like me who can't figure out how to throw the puck. I mean, there, there's even new games that I play that you know they they call it in the gaming world they call it a Sherpa, you know, somebody that'll take you up the mountain. So you you'll see you'll see messages online all the time. Hey, I need you to Sherpa me through this. I don't understand how to throw this bomb. And the community will be like, okay, I got it. Let's go. You're my you're my whatever. We're gonna go together. And um, yeah, I've done that in several games where I'll play and be like. Hey, this is my first time doing whatever, and somebody usually in the the games I play are pretty positive. They're like, "All right, man, let's go. You'll you know do what I say, just look around, you know, follow directions, stuff like that." And I think to me that's a positive part of gaming where you say, "Oh, okay, like oh yeah." You know, you know, like, I think anything that you do that is interactive uh, <clears throat> with another human being, uh, yeah, is going to be uh, is going to be good. Uh, I was I told you earlier I was sort of preparing some thoughts about if you wanted to. Uh, that you might want to wonder about grief and how does that yeah. fit in? I mean, so definitely. Yeah. I mean, that so was my that next. Creative, yeah, that was my creative next. process is uh, uh, gets to it. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> that, that was talking about cancer, um, but uh, uh, but the creative processes um, should I should think would build um, resolution of grief. Uh, grief is grief is not a mental health disorder. Um, grief is a normal part of living uh, right. because people die right. um, <clears throat> or ideas die. Right. Um, and uh, so, uh, but it, it should, grief should not be stuffed um, or used in gaming to distract oneself from grieving mm-hmm. because grieving has a natural po- process um, that leads to acceptance or resolution. Right. Um, and if you stay in a, in a mental position of grief um, where the, the thoughts of loss um, are continually coming into your mind unbidden, um, then it eventually, um, usually within uh, maybe a, a half a year or a year, becomes depression. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, uh, and that's not good. No. Uh, depression is not good. Um, and um, so, and mental, it, when I think about mental illness, the opposite of mental well, illness is not mental health, it's mental wellness. Right. Um, and mental wellness is partly made up of social engagement, um, of productive work, right. um, of fun. Um, of uh, exercise and good sleep and good diet and uh, uh, mindful like habits. So if gaming is contributing to any of those things, then it's healthy. Yeah, I mean, I, I think too, like when people think of grief, it's kind of in a narrow window of death, and that's not always true. You know, people could be going through, you know, they they could go through a breakup or a divorce or oh, like, those are all losses, absolutely. Yeah, or like like you said, you know this you know, the idea of what you thought, like your job, like this is going to be the best job ever. And you get there and after six months, you're like, this is not what I wanted, but I need this job. And so I'm kind of stuck here in the whole, your whole shift of, I don't like this, you know, like, and now I'm here. So what do I do? You know, how do I, how do I do that? You know, how do I come to terms with that? So. Yeah. I've, I've talked to you about, and a few other people, but I've talked to you about my own personal experience with grief has not been about death, uh, physical death. Um, my parents have both died, um, and uh, my grandparents died, and, and I had sadness and a, and a, 
and that's a, that's an expression of grief in the moment, and that might have lasted, you know, a few weeks. Um, I recently saw a beautiful picture of my mother that I'd never seen before, and that brought tears to my eyes. Yeah, um, see someone <clears throat> happy. Yeah. <clears throat> but I have uh, identified it um, uh, with you. Uh, I've told you about it that um, I lived for most of my life with an illusion about what the United States of America stands for. Um, and I always, even when I was a, a revolutionary myself uh, back in the 60s, uh, uh, I always believed in the United States mission of goodness. And that is gone uh, for me. I no longer think that the, Amer the United States of America stands for anything good. Yeah. Um, and I've been grieving that since I realized it. And, uh, um, and that leads me to being critical and uh, leads me to being exasperated uh, and uh, frustrated and avoidant. And all of those are things that happen in, when a person loses a human being to death. Yeah. Um, or when, uh, when you lose a, a partner in some way. Yeah, I think you, like, I wasn't thinking of it the same way you were, but when you articulated that, I was like, oh, yep, yeah, I got a little bit of that too, you know, because I'm fairly young. And over the past few years, I mean, it just seems like everything gets worse and worse, you know. Oh, and I, th and I think <laughs> I, I do not envy you, your age, my son's age. He's 29. Uh, it, it certainly appears that uh, the loss of the planet is on the visible horizon. Yeah. Uh, um, almost certainly not in my lifetime, probably not in your lifetime. Uh, but I'm not so sure about your, if you had children, your children's lifetime. Right. Like the next generation, basically. Yeah, right. Um, it may be, may be that the planet becomes uh, unlivable mm -hmm. um, and, uh, uh, or um, dissolves into chaos. Uh, and, uh, and the movie Dune is out. Uh, oh, yeah, I saw it. It was, and, it was good. I'm looking forward to seeing it, but it, what happened is since I'm here and I have time to read a 500-page book. Uh, yeah, it's pretty <laughs> large, yeah. It's, it's kind of a... I read it in high school, I started reading it again, and I was like, this is long. <laughs> I remember yes. Yeah, it I was like, long. wow. Yeah. And I remember, I really loved the book when it, it came out in 1965. I don't remember if I read it in high school or shortly after, so that would have been late 60s or early 70s. Well, I mean, spoilers, isn't there like six books, I think? Doesn't he continue? There's the, six? Yeah. Well, I've never read any of them except Dune. Yeah, I think when I was in high school, I got to the third one and I had to tap out because I was like, this is so much. It's so much, you know, like it's... Right. You know, it's, it's it a becomes lot. A, like, uh, for those people who are psychologically minded and might be listening to us, uh, <clears throat> John Gray um, wrote... Uh, uh, men are from Mars and women are from Venus. Right, um, I remember that. And yeah. he's got six books and uh, about basically the same title, mm, uh, mm, and mm. he gives workshops on basically the same thing uh, uh, for I get... teenagers, for mm. Christians, for Catholics, for couples, for um, and so there's nothing new in what he's doing. He's I... just readapting. I think the teenagers want to be a rough sell because that's like herding cats where you're like, hey, when you guys calm down, come see me because I don't want to go through I don't want to go through this right now with you guys. You're nuts, you know? So, yeah, I don't. So I guess to, to sum everything up, to, to do like a final thing, um, are, you, are you at least, I mean, you weren't opposed to it before, but like if someone said, if someone came in and said, hey, i am really been thinking about doing playing games or whatever you're like yeah great that's great you know like here's yeah. some resources i think yeah, maybe I i'll i think maybe i'll send you some um maybe i'll send you just some youtube videos like some short ones so you can kind of see like some newer games and see you know it isn't all killing people some of them are but some of them are not some of them are puzzle solvers i'll probably send you some of that P puzzle solving i like the rpg games uh, right is that what they're called uh, role playing games. Yeah, they're pretty much like D like a digital form of D and D where you get to have an avatar, and yeah. that's why I think people that play RPGs are like, ah, D and D's kind of nerdy. I'm like, you do realize you do this every day when you log into whatever game you're playing, like you're basically playing D and D. But yeah, and so one of my friends, as you know, is a uh, um, is an artist, a cartoon artist, mm. um, and uh, so I always like to see what she's doing, and she's written a few 
comics before she got working with uh, Pocket Comics, which is now kind of dissolving. Oh. Um, but uh, <clears throat> uh, so, and I know that she's a big D and D player, um, and uh, uh, so I, I'm very, uh, and she's very mentally healthy. Oh, good. Uh, That's good. So that, That's really good. More so than many people. She's uh, uh, she's 28, I think, and so more so than many other 28 year olds I know, including her, some of her friends, yeah. uh, including my son. Yeah. Uh, well, some uh, of it could just be the amount of information we're getting, where we look at things differently now because we're it's basically easier to research things. You know, even positive things online. Like, even me, if I don't know about a game, because I don't know about every game, I can go online and watch a video and go, that looks interesting, or this part of this is useful, you know? And I think that's cool, that it's easier. Like, music nowadays, too, you can go on YouTube and pretty much find any artist you want. So if you were to mention me an artist from the 60s that I had never heard, I could go online and find him, you know? And as you know, I'm still a beginner in all that. You're the one who introduced me to Twitch. I'd never heard of Twitch yeah. until I met you. you. You can get lost in a sea of Twitch, you know. And again, you just try to find people. You're like, I like this person. They're positive. You know, I like, you know, yeah. what they're saying and stuff like that. Um, and I try to have positive interactions with people online. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, as, as long as you think that it's helpful, uh, I don't do it. I, lo I haven't played in a couple of days because I'm working nights and that messes with my sleep schedule or whatever. Uh, yeah, so. Right. Uh, I was yeah. told I was told when all this started to be two weeks, but it's been a couple months. So I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't blanket uh, uh, call it positive. Uh, I would say that it's likely that it has positive applications. Right. Uh, and uh, uh, I don't feel the same way about. Uh, I've read too much about the research on uh, first person shooter games, uh, uh, and uh, that uh, it doesn't seem to have any kind of positive aspect maybe briefly because it uh, it releases all the anger that a person's got or maybe but, like uh, they say do like hand-eye coordination you know stuff like that it helps uh you're able to spot things quicker sometimes like it's, yeah that's that's a stretch for me i can't imagine it'd be it's different because you're not really using your hands you're using a controller right well i mean to me it seems like that kind of research goes back and forth where Every two years they do a study and they're like, it's good. They're like eggs. Like, eggs are good. Eggs are bad. Eggs are good. Like, it seems like every two years with games. So if you just wait two years, I'll come out with another study and they'll find all this cool stuff that games do. And in another two years, it's terrible. Um, that was one thing. The other thing about uh, those first-person shooter games, since I've, I've uh, seen or been associated with teenagers who play them, is that something about them. I don't know if it's just psychological or if it's the game. You can't just pause it. Yeah, uh, some of that is the way the game is designed. Some games are designed to have an online connection, and when that's designed that way, you can't pause, which yeah. is terrible. Uh, which is very unhealthy, it seems to me, because there, uh, uh, then if I'm sitting in the same room uh, with a, one of my son's friends and he's playing whatever shooter game he's playing, I can't have a conversation with him. Oh, I mean, even in the community, there's talk of that. When a game comes out and the developer goes, hey, there's no offline mode, people get mad. They're like, I got a kid. I'm playing at night because I have 30 extra minutes or whatever, and then I go to bed. You've just ruined that because I can't drop in for 30 or 45 minutes and then come out of it. And <clears throat> there's talk in the community about that of like, there's no offline mode? Man, that sucks. I can't play your yeah. game, you know? And then some people just have bad internet too, where they're like, I can't play that, you know? Like I, you know, right. I, I live somewhere that has terrible internet, so. Um, and all physical games are, you know, you can just stop for a while. Yeah, like I, like I did. Like there's been a couple of days I haven't logged in because I'm like, eh. The one game I'm playing now is kind of violent, but it's also like into gathering and everything and you can build things. And that's kind of what I'm doing with the game. It's like, yeah, I could go kill these things, but I really want to chop this tree down and build whatever, you know? And yeah, so, okay, right. I get yeah, that. that's, that's what I'm cool. doing. Where everybody's off killing stuff, I'm like, well, if I got to, I'll go through this to kill stuff. But I'm really looking for this iron or whatever, or copper, because I want to build something. And that's kind of what I'm using the game for. Yeah, I think that's that could be very interesting. And uh, every every single board game, um, uh, physical board game, there's no problem with saying, you know, I got to go take a pee. Yeah. Um, well, um, I did some Access and Allies games back in the day where we had to leave and we just leave the board up. It's like I'll be yeah, back absolutely. tomorrow. It's right. so Saturday. This is going to take eight hours. 
You know, yeah. I'm I'm behind they, eight ball. I'm the British. I gotta go. <laughs> like, yeah. I did used to play Risk with uh, my friends, and uh, uh, Risk can take hours and hours. Oh and hours yeah. To play, but if you've got decent players, yeah, uh, and uh, it'd be I would have felt myself to be nuts um, to play for eight hours straight. I'm, I'm tired, and uh, um, so let's come back tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. It's it's one of those things. I don't know. So what I would recommend to you is you can maybe find that community of people that you could play the Avalon Hill games with, but there's also a website called Discord. Uh, is that with a C-H or just a C? Uh, Discord, D-I-S-C-O-R-D. C-O-R-D, okay. And then what it, what it is is it's basically a, a free way that people communicate in games. Um, even for me, it's a little bit – like you got to find a server and all that, but you can have people walk you through that too, and it's a free way to talk to people online. So a lot of people nowadays don't like the chat systems that like Sony and Microsoft have made and they'll just get on Discord and be like, hey, what's up, you know? Because you can download it on your phone. So you can have it through your phone while you're playing the game or whatever, you know? And I've used it a little bit and it's really clear audio. And um, we were trying to do something online and we tried using uh, a thing built into the game I was playing and it was terrible. It took 40 minutes. We couldn't figure it out. Within five minutes, we hooked up on Discord and had it working, so... I would, I would recommend Discord because, yeah, maybe I'll look at that. yeah it, like I said, it's free, uh, and you could pay to get better audio or whatever, and they have video there too, so you could do that, but I don't know if you could do that while you're playing. I don't know how that's integrated. Even me, I'm old for Discord, I feel like, sometimes, so, um, but the few times I've used it, it sounds amazing. A lot of podcasters, now that people are doing things remotely, are using it to record their podcasts, and it sounds great. So, yeah, so it might, it might be a thing for your game where if you find a group of people, they may have their own Discord channel set up where they go, hey, come to this channel. We're all going to talk about this Avalon Hill World War II game. And then you could be on there, hey, I'm so-and-so, and I just need someone to walk me through how to do this. It's been a long time, you know, or whatever. Yeah, so, right. Yeah. So Good. I wrote yeah. it down. Yeah. Well, thanks, Bill. Thanks for being on the uh, podcast. Sure. Okay. And uh, thank you, Joe. And I'll look forward to uh, accessing it after you get it up. Yeah. <laughs> So that was it. That was uh, the interview with my therapist. So I hope everybody found it uh, educational and good. I enjoyed talking to Bill, uh, you know, about just how he's doing now that he's semi-retired. Uh, yeah, it was a good talk about grief and games and things like that. And um, I, I'm actually probably going to try to hook up with him and play one of those Avalon Hill games because I was looking online and they're actually available to buy digitally. And then I talked to him about, obviously, Discord. So we could do that. But uh, yeah, I think that's it this week, guys. So I just want to remind you guys again that this podcast will hit my website, www.gamingwithgrief.com, uh, Monday morning at 7 a.m. Go there. Let me know what you think of the show. Uh, leave a comment. Or you could subscribe to the podcast on Apple iTunes or the Google Play Store. Go there. Give me the likes, the subscribes, so all that kind of stuff. Rate me. Let me know how you heard of the show, what you think I can do to improve, stuff like that. Or you can drop me an email at justlittlejoe. Uh, on sorry, it's at Just Little Joe on Twitter, and you can drop me an email at gwgpodfellows at gmail.com. So go there again, write me an email that's gwgpodfellows at gmail.com. Uh, you know, drop me an email, let me know what you think of the show, stuff like that. So that's it for this week, guys. So be healthy, healthy, happy, safe, stuff like that, and I will talk to you guys next week. <laughs>